Hello and welcome to Artificial Intelligence and the Need for a Digital Workforce. I'm Stephanie Wander, the Director of Programs here at the Geotech Center. I'm going to be your host and moderator for today's discussion. I'd like to welcome our incredible group of panelists. First off, we have Paul Doherty. He's the Group Chief Executive for Technology and Chief Technology Officer at Accenture. Paul is also the author of Human Plus Machine, Reimagining Work in the Age of AI, along with an upcoming book called Radically Human. He is also a Geotech Center Commissioner, meaning he serves on our bipartisan commission on the geopolitical impacts of new technology and data for the Geotech Center. I'd also like to welcome Kevin Gallagher, Senior Advisor to the Secretary, U.S. Department of Commerce, and Claudia Del Pozo, Executive Director, Eon Resilience Lab at CMINES. Welcome, everyone. I would really like to turn to each of you to further share anything you would like to about your background, and then tell us a bit about how that background informs your perspective on AI in the future of work. Let's first turn to Kevin. Sorry, let's first turn to Paul, then Kevin, then Claudia. Thank you. Great, Stephanie. I'm really pleased to be participating in this discussion today because this is a, a topic that's very close to close to my heart, so to speak, and uh, close to a lot of the work that I do. You mentioned a couple of books that I've written are on the topic, one of which is about to be published next month. And um, the idea of how humans use technology and how we use technology to benefit humans is at the center of my interest. And uh, as, as Stephanie said, I uh, work for Accenture. I lead our technology business. And uh, we have 675,000 people roughly around the world, so a lot of people. And uh, they're all working in and around technology solutions for clients. And artificial intelligence is increasingly part of the way we run our business. And it's a big part of the solutions that we deliver for clients. And uh, starting a number of years ago, I became very interested in how we make sure that the way we use artificial intelligence is is uh, is one that is done in a way that benefits us as humans from uh, in terms of the way we work in our companies, the way we operate as consumers, and the way it impacts uh, all of us in society, uh, and uh, and uh, you know how it how it impacts uh, you know the breadth of what we do in, within our communities. And I guess that's what I'll be trying to highlight a little bit today is how do you balance all that? When you look at it from a business perspective, how do you look at the right way to use AI to benefit your business? But how do you do that? You know, taking, you know, keeping in mind uh, some of the, co the consequences of AI and how do you prepare your workforce for a future that looks very different as you, you know, as we have increasing adoption of AI. So I'll uh, leave it at that as a start, Stephanie, and uh, we'll get into the discussion. Terrific, thanks so much, Paul. Kevin, over to you. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. I'm thrilled to be with all of you today to talk about a topic that is very important to the Biden-Harris administration and to Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo. Both AI and workforce development are priorities uh, simply because AI is rapidly transforming our world. Remarkable surges in AI capabilities have led to a wide range of innovations that can revolutionize and benefit nearly all aspects of our society and economy everything from commerce and healthcare to transportation and cybersecurity. Our nation needs a workforce that can develop new technology and AI solutions and use AI responsibly, securely, ethically, and effectively. Developing such a workforce requires a greater shared understanding of AI's components, skills, and opportunities, especially for parts of the country in regions that have not traditionally had as much access to AI education and employment opportunities. It's precisely why Secretary Raimondo has prioritized at the Commerce Department workforce. And it's why she's extremely focused on the digital workforce, recognizing that the jobs of tomorrow require digital skills. We are working hand in hand with our colleagues at the Departments of Labor and Education to foster a whole of government approach. We have through the American Rescue Plan, a $500 million good jobs challenge which is a program that's investing in employer-led sector partnerships. We have uh, more than 500 applications, many of which are focused on AI and emerging technology and digital skills. And the Commerce Department is home to the bipartisan infrastructure laws, broadband investments, which is going to deploy more than $48 billion to help close the digital divide, which as part of that work will allow us to invest in digital literacy, and in connecting all parts of our country, particularly those that do not currently have access to reliable, affordable, high-speed internet, which is a game changer in terms of our families and our small businesses being able to make the most of AI and other technology. So I'm thrilled to be here with all of you and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Kevin, for, the, for that important context. Claudia, I'd like to welcome you next. 
Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you for the invitation. I'm really excited to be here with all of you talking about a topic that's just as important um, as exploring the advancements of AI. So my name is Claudia Del Pozo. I work at CMINES. Uh, I'm the director of the Eon Resilience Lab. We're an innovation agency uh, located in different places in Mexico dedicated to exploring and promoting the responsible use and development of artificial intelligence systems for impact in Latin America. And the specific role of the Eon Resilience Lab, which was born during the pandemic, is how can we future-proof society? So this is what Paul and Kevin have been talking about in their introductions. And specifically from the Eon Resilience Lab, we're looking at, um, we've had different projects in different parts of Mexico helping um, local governments explore what AI means. And this is all pre-pandemic. So we've had a, a bunch of work pre-pandemic looking at how we can create a blueprint for places in Mexico to adopt more AI in a, in a way that won't affect their population negatively. So kind of looking at this, like Kevin said, responsible AI adoption. And what's really interesting is that we had um, a project uh, at the beginning of this year um, where we were looking at how the workforce changed during the pandemic. And it kind of th sent things upside down. And that's what I'm excited to tell you about today. Uh, throughout the different questions that we'll be answering, how, how it's affected the workforce in Mexico, but I'm sure that a lot of these insights can be, can be generalized to a lot of other places. Um, and also just to give you more of a context of who, of what CMINES is and what our involvement is in Mexico as an innovation agency, we led the creation of Mexico's AI strategy. And if you have a look at it, you'll see that there's a whole section on future of work and how we can make sure that, um, and, how, and what that means for a country in development like Mexico. So thank you so much and very excited. Yeah, we're so glad to have you. And that's really terrific work. Excited that you guys are leading the way in that regard. Let me turn now to Kevin. Um, I'm gonna ask each of you this question because I think it's so important, but how is AI currently affecting the American workforce and how in turn are you all looking at it in terms of its long-term effect five to 10 years from now? Uh, thanks, Stephanie. It's, it's a great question. And I think what I would say uh, first and foremost is that uh, we at the Commerce Department are really looking at the intersection of AI and workforce development, also AI and equity. And, and as we think about how uh, over the next several years, organizations and individuals will increase their use of AI. That has the potential for businesses and government, frankly, to offer better services and better outcomes to their uh, customers and constituents. Uh, that also has the potential to free up time for people to focus on tasks that require higher level critical thinking and creativity. Uh, but it also means that we have to make sure that that use is responsible and that our workforce is prepared to interact with AI and has the education and resources made available to them uh, to make the most productive use of it. The other place that we think very critically about at the Commerce Department is the intersection of AI and cybersecurity. And so we know that uh, the security of AI products and services is going to require skills at both the workforce level and the consumer level to make sure that they are able to interact with and understand how AI products work and how to do that safely, securely, and responsibly. So uh, we think that the over the next several years, we're going to continue to see uh, an evolution of how AI uh, plays out in the workplace. Uh, I think that was happening pre-COVID, certainly uh, in a post-COVID environment or in an environment where we have learned to live with the changes that have been brought about by COVID, that's only accelerated. And we think that that is a trend that uh, we need to all be ready for, government, business, and the workforce. Terrific, Kevin, thanks for that. Paul, let me turn to you to, to respond and weigh in on this question as well. How do you see AI affecting the workforce and especially in the next five to 10 years? Yeah, I think it, uh... I'll build on what Kevin said. It, it impacts the workforce in a, a profound and dramatic way, is what I would say. I think the AI, there's a set of technologies that are going to dramatically change uh, the course of what we do over the next decade. And AI is one of them. You can think of cloud, you can think of AI, you can think of you know, the metaverse, which we can get into a little bit as as uh, as technologies that are really going to transform uh, the way we uh, the way we live, play, work, and everything we do. And um, 
you know, the question that comes up around AI that we did a lot of research on for our first, first book was, well, is this going to destroy jobs or create jobs? And, um, and that's at the heart of the question for a lot of people. And we firmly believe, based on the research we've done and the third-party research and what we've seen played out since we wrote that first book, is that AI net-net will create uh, will create jobs. That's supported by research like that coming recently from the World Economic Forum that showed that AI will, will, uh, will eliminate um, this, uh, or automate 85 million jobs in the next several years, but it'll create 97 million, you know, net surplus of 12 million new jobs. And this, this, yeah, and um, and the, really the issue is what Kevin started to get at is how do you make sure people are prepared for the different types of jobs that they need to do, and that's the grand challenge that we have. And I think it's it's a really it's a really tough challenge. I think we need to recognize that this is a big challenge, and uh, you need to tackle it on many fronts. And the um, and I think you need to break it down into categories because there's the, there's three different categories. Maybe there's people who do AI, people who use AI, and people who uh, will be affected by AI. The people who do AI, it's clearly, there's a shortage of them. We need more people who do AI, the, the AI uh, engineers and uh, de uh, uh, deep learning experts and such that are needed to develop the AI solutions. We need many more of them. There's a shortage uh, overall, 500,000 uh, computer science uh, uh, people, uh, graduates uh, just, just in the US and a large part of, of that will be around artificial intelligence and those types of skills. Uh, so we definitely need to develop more people who, who do AI. Uh, then we need to prepare the people who use AI. AI, the, the one mistake people make is sometimes thinking about AI replacing a job. AI is, does tasks. It, it's, it's individual things. If you're a loan approval officer, you, you still need a loan approval officer. Some of the tasks that you do in approving a loan can be automated more effectively through AI. And are we preparing people for the changing nature of their jobs as, as they occur? And I think that's a big task for business. Um, and that's, that's the people who use AI. And the people who are affected by AI are all of us. We're all using AI every day. I mean, so you, people probably don't realize that you've used multiple different AIs, everyone listening, you know, throughout the day. And, you know, if you use uh, Siri, if you did a search on Google, if you bought something from Amazon, if you bought something from Walmart, uh, if you reserved something on Airbnb, whatever, you know, you can go, go through the gamut. So we're all affected by AI. And that gets to one thing Kevin said, is we need to educate people on how these things work and what the consequences are, how they use data and how it might impact, uh, you know, the way your personal data is used in, in algorithms and such, which gets to responsible AI, which is a topic I'm sure we'll get into. So um, those are, that's, I think, the impact. I tend to be a glass, glass half full on this issue in that I do believe there's net a uh, huge benefit to us as uh, as the human race and our society and, and what we do in business and, and government from AI. We have a grand challenge to make sure we're preparing people well enough for what's ahead. And I think there's more work to do on, on that front. And, uh, you know, the benefits outweigh the risks, but it takes awareness and collective action across public and private sector and educators and others to make sure we navigate this well. Yeah, absolutely. That'll very much be, I think, in line with some of the things we talk about today. Let me turn to Claudia now. Claudia, I'll open up the question a bit for you in that, you know, I, I think I asked it with a sort of American-centric assumption here. Let's let's maybe talk a bit more about a global perspective on workforce and, and how you're seeing it, for, particularly from where you're, your vantage point. Definitely. So to, to, to focus on Mexico, and I think it's going to be the case for a lot of um, other countries in the developing world and most of Latin America, one of the main things, one of the main questions that we have here about automation is, is it worth it? Because unfortunately, or you know, depending on how you look at it, unfortunately, fortunately, the cost of labor here is very low. So the question sometimes is it's, it's not worth automating this, um, also depending on if you're looking at it short term, long term. So maybe automation here isn't happening as fast as in other places. And something else to consider that I mentioned um, just earlier is that Automation isn't the only thing driving the future of work anymore. The pandemic has really transformed the whole the whole panorama and everything that's going on. So I want to give you just some some points to consider of like how this affected Mexico, just so you see how, how different things are. So, for instance, we th this um, I wish I could recommend this research document, but I can only recommend it if you speak Spanish, um, but it's on our website. Um, so, for instance, the, the cities where there were most jobs before the pandemic are now the cities where are, there are the least jobs. So that includes Mexico City, which used to be a city, I mean, it's one of the biggest cities in the world. Suddenly, it's one of the cities with least jobs in Mexico. So that's something that's really interesting. 
And before the pandemic, there was a lot of trust in sectors. So there's this, there's this survey that the government does with regards to um, directors and decision makers in different industries and how much trust they have in that industry, which in turn can tell us how much investment they're planning on making. So while the discourse in Mexico is still, let's automate to make it more efficient, in reality, trust in industries has dropped to an all-time low, meaning there is definitely not, money is definitely not going to be used to automate these, these industries. So I think that we've kind of um, gained time to gain time before automation really starts in Mexico. And hopefully, like Paul, you were mentioning, you know, we can use this time in a clever way to prepare the, the different groups of people um, who will be well, who will be affected by this, which, as you said, is pretty much everyone. Um, and, and another thing that was interesting during the pandemic in Mexico is that a lot of there were 800 percent more websites. So suddenly a lot of companies were saying, OK, the only way we can survive is if we go digital. Um, and I think that's something that happened throughout the developing world. So a lot of companies went digital and this is their first approach. And I'd say, well, little by little, they're going to offer their, their products online. They're going to be adopting, you know, the different tools that companies that have been established online have been using for ages now. And so little by little, there will be a need for more um, as well. Kevin and Paul, you mentioned for more talent in AI. And that's something that has been a challenge in Mexico and globally for a very long time now. There's not enough talent uh, to develop this need. But so just to wrap up here in a nutshell, what will the future look like? It looks like the pandemic, kind of like a little silver lining of the pandemic is that it's given us time to consider how to move forward in a, in a responsible way. And it's brought more people into the digital world. So that's a little perspective from Mexico. Thanks, Claudia. I want to go ask a follow-up because I thought it was really uh, very striking what you said about sort of game time before automation, you know, spikes in Mexico. And I think you'll hear the Geotech Center and I have a feeling you'll hear, you know, uh, government and you'll hear, you know, folks like Paul from the private sector say that we've got to be striving for, for, for equity, equity and technology. But to your point, you're sort of saying, well, maybe the, the, slow, roll, a, the slow roll is a reality. B, maybe there's some benefit to it. So can you give us a bit more context? Is, is the different pace of AI adoption, do you see that as a, as a, a problem to be solved or do you see that as potentially a benefit, a benefit or in some ways something that we should be leveraging further? Um, so I think that what's been happening with AI adoption, it, it's, it's being seen as a race. You know, a lot of companies are adopting it because they say, you know, if we don't have AI, everyone else does, we need to do it. So I think this slowing down is going to be positive. Of course, it does pose a problem in terms of international competitiveness because some countries are more affected by than others by this slowing down. But as a you know, as a think tank that looks at the ethical, human-centered, responsible AI, I think it's really positive. Um, and and I really hope that it will be taken advantage of properly. I know that in Mexico there is a lot of concern about the future of work. Because, of course, the media, um, the way it's portrayed by the media is very different to the reality. Like Paul mentioned, you know, it's about tasks, not jobs. So I hope that this time will be taken to really ask the important questions that we were skipping previously. And one interesting fact during the, the pandemic, actually, the two sectors that accelerated uh, their automation most, um, which were energy energy and technology and education also prioritized reskilling and upskilling. So it seems, so that's interesting. You know, that was part of our research. We were saying, okay, please, we hope that there's a correlation between the industries that had most automation and most upskilling. That is the case. So hopefully we're taking this time to reflect and that trend will continue. Paul and Kevin, let me turn to you to see if you want to weigh in on, on sort of that take. What about the different pace of, paces of change, you know, vis-a-vis -vis equity? How do we how do we responsibly navigate this? Yeah, yeah, I'll jump in real quickly a few points. Claudia just made some really, really great points. The uh the uh what we've seen from the brief we just uh, did some research that we're haven't published yet, but we're about to publish that that shows that Ape is a global survey of global companies, large organizations generally. And it shows that only uh, eight percent are really implementing AI at scale. You know, uh, at this point, 
a lot are dabbling in it. A lot are a lot of you know people are saying things are AI that might not really be artificial intelligence. So we say eight eight percent really doing it well at scale, which shows how much more there is to come. We're really in the early days of this, and AI itself you have to understand AI itself is moving so rapidly with new techniques coming online continuously. I'm not sure I see this, the pause happening as much though as Claudia said. It'd be interesting to see. I think I see a, I see the hunger to accelerate it more. So we're seeing a lot of priority in the boardrooms and in organizations to accelerate AI. But I, I think it really, to the fundamental point Claudia was making though, I think it really is important uh, for us to focus on equity right now. There's, there's a couple dimensions of it. There's the digital divide that Kevin mentioned, things like access to technology and such are critical you know, to make sure people uh, you know, have, have basic access to the technology and issues like uh, gender and underrepresented minorities and such are really critical because there are some big gaps. Uh, I serve on the board of Girls Who Code as an example. And, uh, from, you know, the statistics we talk about there are that, uh, uh, you know, when I graduated from college in the 80s, uh, 35 uh, percent of the graduates in computer science were women. Today, it's 32%, so it's down as a percentage. And uh, we've made a lot of gains in numbers and are making some gains, but there's a lot more to be done to get to inclusion and, and equity in the education and attraction to the workforce too. There's something we need to work on across the public and private sector. What we found in that Girls Who Code research is that a uh, number of, of uh, a lot of girls are actually turned off by computer engineering because the stereotypes of the industry, the lack of celebration of the amazing pioneers that there have, women pioneers that there have been in the, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the computer science field, you know, women like Grace Hopper and many, many others. And uh, so there's work we need to do to level the playing field from some of the, the role models of tech that get modeled or get celebrated today to those that represent the real true reality of the inclusive nature that we need going forward to get to the equity we need. And I think it's so important because getting to the theme of radically human, you know, this, this theme that I've been on is we are designing technology that has more human impact than anything else we've ever done before. And if there's ever a technology that needs an inclusive population to be designing it and anticipating what the consequences are going to be, it's now. Uh, the consequences of this are far greater than developing payroll systems on an IBM mainframe 20 years ago. We're shaping human behavior now. Humans are going to use technology for the next generation, and it must be done with a, a workforce that starts you know, with inclusion and equity at the center. Um, Claudia, I believe you actually have something that you wanted to say on sort of how humans shape AI adoption. So let's turn back to you really quick. And then, Kevin, I'm going to turn over to you. And let's talk a little bit about sort of the positive impacts of workforce disruption and where you see it headed. But first, Claudia, over to you real quick. Perfect. Yeah, I just wanted to bounce back on what you mentioned, Paul. I think that the, the acceleration that you're seeing in the U.S. is something that I, I obviously, you know, in terms of competitiveness, that's really important. So I do hope that, that countries like Mexico can look at that and say, OK, we, we definitely need to move forward. But Something that was really interesting as well during the pandemic and that that made me and, and the whole I think me and a lot of uh, people in this area realize that there's a huge difference in culture between Latin America and the US, Canada, Europe, is that while while those countries were, were looking, you know, we're we're saying, OK, we're in a rut right now. There's a pandemic. We don't know what's happening. We need to invest in, um, I don't know, macroeconomic analyses and understanding what's happening. Here in Latin America, the, the opposite reaction is what happened. It was like, let's, let's not invest. We, we don't know what's happening. We need to save money and see how we can do better in the future. So I think that there's that really interesting layer of how culture affects AI adoption. And it will be interesting to see now where there's these different speeds and these different kind of appetites for risk, how we can work together to, to reach optimal adoption speed without forgetting, well, taking into account competitiveness, but also the need for responsibility. So I just wanted to, to point that interesting fact out, but um, on to Kevin. Kevin, I've got to imagine that you are, are thinking about how culture influences AI adoption as well across our country. So, so tell us a bit more about your perspective here. Yeah, I mean, first, let me say that um, I think Paul's point uh, around the competitiveness and the, the likely dramatic increase that we're going to see in the near future is, is spot on. And I would say as it relates to global markets, one place that we have a lot of data at the Commerce Department is around exports. And I can tell you that the trends around the export of American AI products and services is, is in a rapid increase and only likely to continue to grow. And so from an, from a, an American economy perspective, 
uh, we see it as a critical sector that will help increase our nation's capabilities uh, and frankly, our national and economic security. I also think it is something that we will uniquely bring to our allies uh, because we are all in different places when it when it comes to current development. That implicates lots of other issues we talk about at the Commerce Department, like IP protection and the control of the export and sale of sensitive technologies, which are going to obviously include AI systems. But I do think that this is something that is going to be a global place for America to, to share its leadership uh, and has the potential, as Paul mentioned, to see a dramatic increase in jobs. The place that uh, I, I think um, both Claudia and Paul mentioned this, but it really resonated with me. Uh, we need the sectors that are going to rely on and increase their adoption of AI practices to also commit to upskilling their workers. And that's what Claudia was mentioning about the two sectors that saw the greatest impact of AI recently. Uh, it is, uh, as Paul mentioned, it is going to replace tasks, is going to make tasks more efficient uh, you'll be able to delegate some to AI, but you're not going to be able to replace uh, entire roles. And certainly you're not going to be able to replace the higher level of critical thinking and creativity uh, that that uh, both American workers and workers globally bring to, to their work. So uh, at the Commerce Department, we really think about it sector by sector and making sure that in, in each uh, in each industry, as you see bank tellers becoming fewer and fewer in the financial services industry, you see lots of increases in that industry in other types of jobs. The connection that has to be made is the pathway that allows that worker who was originally uh, a, a teller or in, in the lower um, level position in a financial industry to make that transition. And that's gonna require uh, government industry, our educational uh, partners, uh, to commit to really focusing on creating direct pathways that allow workers whose roles are disrupted by AI to be able to move up the career ladder and take advantage and to be a part of and to be a part of the full opportunity that AI is going to create across the economy. Absolutely. Paul, can I ask you to build on this, please? Because I, I think this is such an important question. I think we all recognize the importance of reskilling. We all recognize the importance of ensuring people are, you know, are able to transition well. But I think, where would you say we need to go in terms of maximizing the positive impacts of workforce disruption? What ways can we actually make sure everyone's benefiting from automating some jobs? Yeah, I think I, I, I'll just pull together a few things we've talked about and add a, add a couple more. I think that it, there's a, I'll, I'll hit maybe four points that I think really need to focus, focus on. The first, from a business perspective, businesses need to take accountability for training their workforce and equipping them and enabling them for this future that's ahead. The way I put it when I when I talk to you know companies that we're working with is, you know, you don't know, you don't yet know the jobs of the future because they're going to evolve based on use of AI and some tasks and such. But one thing I can guarantee you is you're not going to be able to go hire that profile on Monster.com because you know it, it, I'll give you an example why in a second. You're going to need to you're going to need to invest in your workers and train them on how to use this new technology. So it's it's not, it's it's about your employees and helping them move ahead, but it's about you know the best way to prepare your business. I'll give you a simple example. There was a, a company we worked with that's in the, in this case, they're in the uh, the energy business and they uh, they have drills and, and such that they operate. They had physical field services technicians that operated pumps, you know, manual physical equipment. Well, as that got automated, introduced technology, it was automated with um, a gaming engine that could visualize what was really happening under the ground. The interface went from pumps and wheels to digital. It went from reactive, something breaks, and then I have to throw, throw a new segment of pipe down to proactively saying, hey, the torque's getting too high, the temperature's getting too high, let me change and adjust what I'm doing. It completely transformed the job. So the, the job went from physical technician to gaming engine enabled, visualization aware, uh, anticipatory, you know, engineer. You're not going to be able to hire one of those that knows the domain of, of energy. You need to. You're going to need to evolve your workforce to the point where they they, they use these new skills. So that's the business obligation. We're doing things in our company like we, we developed something called TQ Technology Quotient. AI is one of the pieces of it. And each one of our 675,000 people, even if they're not doing anything related to AI, needs to take that training so that they understand the implications it might have on their job. The second area is, is education, K through 12, and what we need to do and transforming, you know, transforming it so that um, 
you know, I'm a big supporter of code.org and related initiatives that are about getting digital literacy, coding, and elements of AI into every every step, starting in kindergarten all the way through K through 12. And I think that's an important investment for us to make in our future to do it in an inclusive way, as we've already talked about. The third thing is I think we need a lot of government and, and uh, public and private sector cooperation on things like apprenticeships and community-based training and things like that. Uh, we've we've gone through our the, our job descriptions of people we hire and now 40, I think it's 45% of our the roles we have don't require a traditional four-year degree, 45%. Uh, we've set a target in the U.S. that 20% of the people we hire will be through apprenticeships, and uh, and uh, and we're investing in apprenticeships with uh, you know paying a you know paying a market wage while people learn and then develop the skill they need to to evolve into a job in our company, and, it, and that's what helps build the skills. It's what helps you know attract uh, employees, new employees into the workforce with the relevant skills from from uh, different backgrounds. It helps build the inclusiveness, and I think that's a key part of the future. And then the fourth thing is maybe a little bit wild card I'll throw in and we can go down this path later if you want to, is I think sustainability is a big part of what we need to think about in, in, the, in this whole equation because we haven't talked about it a lot yet, but AI on its own can be tremendously damaging from a sustainability in, impact. Uh, you know, uh, total technology emissions were, were 4% in uh, about 2013. They're about 6% or I'm sorry about that. Uh, uh, yeah, about 6% today, and they're projected to get up to 14% by 2030. A lot of that's driven by AI and the incredibly uh, compute intensive and data intensive nature of it. So we need to understand how to use AI in responsible ways from a sustainability perspective and also make sure that it's having a positive impact on the, um, on, uh, you know, using AI to actually solve sustainability, which I believe is huge impact uh, and opportunity to do. So those are few elements that I think about when I think about what we need to do, how do we need to prepare the workforce and what kind of education do we need? Paul, can I just unpack one quick follow-up on that? Um, when you're talking about sustainability in this case, you're talking about sustainability of AI systems and our ability to scale AI, or are you talking about sustainability from a different angle? Um, that that last point was about sustainability, like the carbon intensity of- Okay, so okay. environmental sustainability, got it. Okay, wanted to just make sure we're speaking the same yeah. thing here. Yeah. Kevin, let me now turn to you. Um, do you, do your perspectives differ like from, from, you know, do you see technologists and policymakers having different views on automation? And if, and if so, how do we bridge the gap? I, I don't see different views. Um, I think that both policymakers and technologists uh, are focused on the benefits of AI and also are well aware of the risks. And I would say, you know, as we think about at least at the government perspective, uh, AI's benefits of efficiency and effectiveness in automating processes and being able to deliver for constituents in a quicker, more direct way. Um, they do introduce the risk for bias, discrimination, security, if it's not planned for and managed carefully. Uh, Paul mentioned you know, public-private partnerships in this space, and I think that's true as AI develops as a critical technology, I also think it's true on the workforce piece. Uh, you know, companies like Accenture, Paul's well aware of this, they were doing work from home before the pandemic. Uh, and I think the, uh, the reality is uh, that we need to increase opportunities for folks across the board uh, to access jobs that weren't in the, or, or aren't in or aren't based in their geographic location. And by uh, using tools like apprenticeships and other programs, Oh, I think we will see that. And the more folks that we can get comfortable with AI and the more folks who are aware of its benefits and are prepared for the workforce of today and tomorrow, we'll get at Claudia's point around trust. Uh, people won't trust a new system until they have a chance to use it and until they see uh, that whether it's from an ethical perspective, from a cybersecurity perspective, that they can engage with that product safely, securely, and responsibly, and that the information is being used to their benefit. I think the point that Paul made about digital equity is really at the heart of this, and it's where we will see uh, the intersection between uh, really connecting Americans uh, and giving them access to reliable, affordable, high-speed internet and opening up those opportunities for them to engage with AI to work remotely, to take advantage of the apprenticeships and other programs that Paul's saying. That will help with, with employers' equity goals. It will also just increase opportunity across the board. It'll create economic activity across the board. Uh, and I think it is exactly in that space 
where industry and government connect uh, because it does create real positive benefits for both sides of that coin. Great points, Kevin. Um, Claudia, let's turn to you now. How are you seeing reskilling occurring in Mexico? How is this playing out, you know, there? So, so I mean, there's always the question, you know, who should be in charge of reskilling? And if we look back at Mexico's AI strategy, which we published in 2018, one of the main points there was, um, well, first of all, you know, establishing that question, but saying that companies obviously should uh, prioritize reskilling their their employees. But unfortunately, um, through our research, that's not what we're seeing. That's not necessarily what's happening. And Paul, I'm really, I'd be really interested in knowing more about what companies say when you tell them, you know, you're not going to be able to just rehire your entire workforce. You have to reskill. I think that's completely true. Um, but in the surveys that we've seen here in Mexico, there seems to be a preference for um, just, just simply rehiring new experts. And so what we are seeing is that there are certain companies that are focusing on offering reskilling services. And those companies aren't being met with the openness they'd expected uh, by companies here. And, and I think that might be the case. Um, I, I wouldn't want to say everywhere, but maybe throughout Latin America, kind of um, just saying, well, well, let's see, let's let's wait till we get there. Let's see what happens. And and one of the interesting ideas was, you know, what if these reskilling companies that offer those services collaborated with automation companies. So what if they came in as a package and said, okay, we're gonna do responsible automation and go forward in this way. So I know some companies are kind of looking at that possibility here in Mexico. Um, and I think that, I guess we'll see what happens. As I said earlier, you know, the, the, the most, um, the industries that automated most in the past few years are also the ones with most reskilling. Um, so th that offered most reskilling. So that's that's encouraging. Um, another thing I I'd like to touch upon is uh, cobotting, which Kevin, you mentioned, you know, um, how how people won't be able to adopt a technology if they don't trust it. And I think that's key, creating trust around these technologies, creating an understanding. I mean, this is the center of the whole thing, you know, creating awareness and understanding that we're not taking your jobs. That's not what's happening. Rather, the tasks will change and you need to learn um, new skills in order to move forward. And I think that's something that's already happening little by little. Um, and, and the need really to have a human overview of AI systems is becoming key in this conversation. So, you know, what's going to happen is not, AI is not going to replace a doctor, you know, that should definitely not be what happens. And that's why we need strong regulation in place. What we need is an AI system that can help doctors do their job better. And then, so, so that's the example with doctors, but I think it can apply with, um, with teachers and, and, and anyone who, who, who would benefit of using AI for their job. But I think that one thing that maybe isn't so common, um, isn't mentioned so much is, yes, I do think that sometimes an AI system can kind of work on its own and do something that a human being couldn't do. So I just want to, to, to make a quick uh, example of that here. There's a case study where, alt where um, so professors in the, in the US created an AI system that's capable of detecting Alzheimer's, well, detecting signs of Alzheimer's in a person's, in a person's head. So that's something that doctors cannot do. But suddenly with the system, we're able to do it. So I think that's an interesting case where, well, yeah, we, we, we don't understand it. You know, it's, it's something that doctors can use, but it's maybe it's not, let's say it's doing a new job, a job that didn't exist before. And I think that it's interesting to see how we can work with AI together to create better results, how some things will be purely human and some things might be purely AI and that's okay. And we need to, to understand that and move forward and see what strategies can make the best of, of both worlds. Paul, I believe she signaled to you first. Would you like to respond? Yeah, the, uh, on, well, on, the, on the question, I, uh, I think there is a big gap between what I said and what companies are doing, which I think is what the first thing Claud Claudia said. Uh, I would say that, that the pandemic 
has changed that a little bit because for a couple of reasons. One is we saw the pandemic increasing the demand for digital skills by a factor of about 3x. So there's a much more heightened need for the skills and awareness. And, and that and then there's been this great resignation effect and you know, a lot of you know shortage of workers and everything else going on. So it's got people thinking a lot more as, about the, the, their human capital and their talents and what they do with it. So we're seeing more uh, more awareness around it, but I, I agree with you. That's it's a, Claudia. It's a big gap. It's one of the messages I always talk about with with companies is you you, you need to take accountability for learning as a key you know as a key uh, attribute of your strategy going forward, your business strategy and your workforce strategy. So on that specific point, I have some thoughts on the uh, on the trust issue too, but I'll, I'll pause on on that for now, Stephanie. Pardon me. Why don't we Why don't we go in and tackle trust, Kevin? That was brought up by Claudia. How do you see it? And then Paul will turn back to you to weigh in as well. Yeah, I would say a few things. First, at the top of the panel, Paul mentioned that we are all already interacting with AI. You can't use your applications today on your smartphone without it. Uh, and there's lots of benefits to uh, health outcomes, better access to government services. Uh, what I think the this really comes down to is the lack of shared benefit and shared opportunity across, at least from the US's standpoint, across the country. And that's why the digital equity piece that Paul was mentioning earlier is just so important. We know, and the pandemic really highlighted the fact that we have families in our country who were not able to access remote work, whose children were not able to participate in remote school, they weren't able to access, uh, remote uh, telehealth or remote medicine, they were they lost connection between families and friends. It's it's a real stark issue uh, that has been you know really revealed as a result of the pandemic. And until we address that fundamental issue, until we have reliable, affordable, high speed internet uh, for every American, I don't think we can overcome the trust issue. I think that we will always be in a situation where we have haves and have nots without that. And so that's why, the, as from the administration's point of view, it is such a priority for us uh, and why Congress appropriated $65 billion to work to close the digital divide. The other piece I'd say is that this is going to really rely on our education partners and incorporating AI and, and cybersecurity, talking about ethics and AI and, and really being honest about it. Uh, through education, whether that's K through 12 education or higher education. And Paul mentioned some companies uh, that have partnered with education institutions uh, and some nonprofit organizations that are increasing computer science skills, that are increasing access to opportunities uh, for to learn coding. Uh, it's going to take all of that in a very holistic approach to, and, and making sure that all that is available to everyone everywhere in America. That's how I see us getting past the trust issue. Paul, I'd love for you to respond. Yeah, the, uh, uh, the trust is, um, uh, to me, is this fundamental issue of, of underlying all of this for, for you know, the reasons Claudia and, and Kevin talked about. I think people like to talk about, you know, come up with different analogies of data as the new you know, oil or gold or whatever. I think, I think it's really trust. Trust is is what's going to differentiate organizations and companies and countries, you know, in terms of how they of how they succeed. And AI and that's important with AI because it can create profound issues around trust. You know, things like we see with the use of algorithms and fake news and, and things like that, uh, suspicion of how data is being used in alg recommendation algorithms and such. So, trust. Um, my message to business is that. Uh, trust is a hot, you know, everybody's always would want to be trusted, but trust is actually a differentiator going forward. If I trust you more than the next company, when you get, when you're in a world of in-home grocery delivery and very invasive, very personalized services, which is the future, you're only going to do that with companies that you have huge amounts of trust in. And those that violate your trust are dead, you know, and that's, that's the, that's the trust becomes a, a key differentiator. The way you get trust, I think there's five, you know, there's, you know, five principles of what that I would talk about with responsible AI, which are, which are um, uh, transparency, which some people say is explainability, so understanding what it does, you know, what AI is doing, and educating people on how AI works. That's critical. A second one is fairness, so eliminating bias from systems, which is entirely doable. I think it's inexcusable that there's you know still so many examples of bias in AI systems because it's a matter that's a matter of methodology and how you do it and 
how you screen for bias and, and we shouldn't accept, you know, we shouldn't uh, accept uh, biased consequences. That's a second point. A third one, which is obvious, but needs to be said is honesty. Uh, there's companies who use AI to, to circumvent, um, circumvent policies and regulations and such, and that obviously shouldn't be, shouldn't be allowed. And then the, uh, the, the next one is accountability, which Claudia got into. There should be, if, if, you, if your answer, if I ask an executive, who's accountable for the results of that algorithm or that AI, if they say something about the technology or the algorithm, I say, you know, you're in big trouble. A human at the end of the day needs to be accountable for what's happening and own the results. And uh, we need to make sure that that's true for every element of AI. And then I'd add in sustainability, which I talked about earlier. If you're, if you're developing responsible AI, uh, you know, things like getting that extra tenth of one, one tenth of one degree of precision in your in your AI model that's powered by deep learning and big data can can, can double your you know the, the emissions, the compute power, if not done if not done right. So you need to be really thinking about those types of impacts so we don't drive the you know the compute related uh, consumption of, of carbon and energy off the charts as we as we uh, as we implement AI. And conversely. AI will be the solution to a lot of our sustainability and sustainable development goal issues if used properly, which we need to, to get onto as well. Yeah, Paul, super important points on, on sustainability and, and, and sort of the environmental future of AI. Um, I do want to come back to that, but I wanted to unpack something that you said about fairness a bit and turn to Claudia for a second. Claudia, how do you see as the public and private sectors practically building an inclusive and diverse workforce, given that that's so essential to to, to building fairness and ensuring that people have buy-in that indeed our systems are being fair. Exactly, I think that that topic of trust and fairness really links back to talent and the future of the workforce. I mean, if we want fairness, um, I think that fairness also, and, and transparency and explainability, you know, people understanding that they're interacting with an AI system or an AI system was involved at some point during certain process or decision that's affecting them. They need to know that. and. I think the best way to do that is obviously to have a diverse team of people who are able to translate from the technical aspects to, you know, more of a more of a um, yeah general public language. And and we, we've done different um, exercises or programs through CMINES where we were able to really see the importance of having a diverse workforce. So before going to the general, I want to give you this example. So one of our programs was to create more transparency and explainability um, within companies that use AI for their services and products. So we were talking to the technical team to really understand what was going on and be able to translate it and suggest how they may improve on the aspects of transparency and explainability. And there was this one company where we were we were just not managing to, to, to like there was there, we needed a translator basically between the technical team and us, and and we they weren't really answering our questions. It was really difficult to talk to them and, and understand really what was going on. And suddenly there was a, a psychologist on their team who'd been in all the calls but who hadn't spoken. Um, who suddenly just just started talking and tra translated absolutely everything and basically created their transparency and explainability system. And I think that's where the value lies of having, I mean, it's always been clear that if you have more diverse companies, you know, they will do better. But more and more, we're seeing it with clear examples and with AI as well. You know, it's not just about the technical team. And I think that when we talk about diversity, we think, OK, we need more women. We need more people from different backgrounds on the technical team. But what you really need is a holistic team with different perspectives, um, with perspectives from sociology, philosophy, um, psychology, so that they can bring that together and not only explain better what you're doing to the outside world so you can generate trust with clients or potential clients, but also so that they can ask you as a developer the right questions. And that's really what, what went on um, in that company that I was mentioning. And uh, this is actually a woman. And what's interesting here is that it links into gender equality in the AI world because these fields of uh, the technical fields are obviously more dominated by men, but these kind of more um, hu human science fields, um, sociology uh, are more dominated by women. So I think that's also an interesting way to get more diversity in and more gender equality is realizing the importance of having a real diversity of roles um, in the company and 
I think only that way will you really be able to create fair systems because they'll be asking the right questions. These people who have a more philosophical way of thinking and that the tech team working with them can answer them and make sure that, that their system is trustworthy and that thus, you know, their company will continue being functioning and, and will not go down in a terrible crash because of a, you know, bad reputation shared all over the news or something like that. So. So yeah, that's that's something exciting that I hope will be more understood and that tech companies will be looking to hire more graduates from those um, um, human science fields. Paul and Kevin, I see you both nodding. So um, Paul, let me turn to you first uh, to, to respond to Claudia. Uh, no, I, I agree. The, um, the uh, and I think the, I think the converse, you know, the thing, if training people to be more like machines and we're hiring people to be more like machines we're, we're going to have a problem <laughs> you know i think the uh the what we need to be doing is is um emphasizing the human you know the human qualities and thinking about you know human related things so i think the human sciences that claudia called out is exactly right and uh things like uh cross domain problem uh, examination, communication, empathy, you know, those types of skills become really important in the future. If you think about, you know, domains of AI application like health, you know, by, you know President, you know, President Biden called for ARPA-H, the ARPA Health, which is going to have a lot of, you know, this type of technology in it, it's going to be, uh, open up whole new categories of jobs for people who have the right uh, human skills partnered with the, you know, technology and AI will deploy to solve healthcare problems in, in new ways, just as one example. So I, I think that sometimes I see people saying we got to double down on, on STEM and I'm a big supporter of STEM. That's how I grew up and how I was educated. We need more STEM. We need more engineers and everything else too. But we definitely, you know, whether you want to call it STEAM or, you know, books on liberal arts or human sciences, I think it becomes critical uh, in the application of technology to AI going forward because we're, again, we're, 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 Technology is now shaping the world. It's not just technology powering the back office of governments or businesses. And if technology is shaping the world, those uh, softer, you know, softer skills may be the wrong word, but the human skills uh, become really essential. So Kevin, let me turn it over to you either to respond to what's already been said, or I'd love to hear how you see small businesses adopting AIs as, as kind of playing into this equation of fairness and equity. Yeah, let me uh, let me address both. The only thing I would add to what Claudia and Paul have already said is that I also think automation has the potential to make the workplace safer, uh, and I think that that has uh, real uh, interesting and important benefits as we think about worker safety and how uh, folks who are in manual labor and physical labor jobs uh, might benefit from. Uh, AI and automation in taking care of some of the aspects that were actually the most dangerous of the activities that they were being asked to perform as workers. And I think that there's a really important angle there uh, that makes the workplace safer. Uh, as we think about small businesses, uh, I think that's a real uh, challenge and opportunity. And it is a place where I believe government can actually play an important role. And uh, I think you know, as I, I think about how we at the federal level might approach something like supporting small businesses with AI uh, and having an AI workforce, uh, I think we can draw a lot of lessons from a very successful program uh, at the Department of Commerce called NICE, the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education. Uh, it is a partnership between government, academia, and the private sector. It is basically born out of an acknowledgement that all businesses, including small businesses, need to have a workforce that is aware of and addressing cybersecurity issues, and also acknowledging that many small businesses don't even have an HR person, never mind an HR department that has a training component to it that can deliver those services. And so working across government, academia, and the private sector, uh, we have been able to really uh, energize, promote, and coordinate a robust community working together to advance the integrated ecosystem of cybersecurity education, training, and workforce development. NICE has a framework that is offered free to small businesses to use to help uh, improve communications about how to identify, recruit, develop, and retain cybersecurity talent. Uh, it helps uh, address a consistent lexicon. It helps small businesses really understand uh, what they need to do to address their cybersecurity workforce needs. 
Uh, and I think that that's really an important place where the federal government can lean in to support small businesses by making resources available that help them address their AI workforce challenges. The only other thing I would add on the small business front is I think that there are some who believe uh, that the small business employees uh, are the ones who are the most at risk because small businesses may not have the same ability to upskill and reskill. And what I would say is, I think small businesses, and this goes back to a point that, that Paul made and that Claudia made, uh, if small businesses really lean in and rely on their existing workforce and just are honest and transparent with their existing workers, uh, there is a bond, a loyalty there. Uh, these small business owners who are the majority employers in America have really invested in their workers. They know their workers. They care about their workers. They just survived the pandemic with their workers. They tend to have dramatically better retention than larger companies. Uh, and so I, I think that small businesses with support and with help and in partnership can uh, very successfully upskill their existing employees and to do so in a way that still maintains all of the benefits that so many Americans get by working at a small business. Kevin, thank you so much for that. What a great point to end on. Um, obviously, we have a lot of work to do and a whole nother hour of conversation that we should have on this topic. Unfortunately, we are nearing the end of our time. So let me turn back to each of you for a final remark, a Twitter length sort of synthesis of what your takeaway is from this conversation. Um, Claudia, let me first start with you and then we'll go to Paul and then Kevin for the wrap. Perfect. Um, so part of my synthesis actually is, is bouncing back on what you said, Kevin. And I think small businesses, at least what we're seeing in Mexico, is that suddenly when let's say young people were, were having more of a problem entering the workforce, but suddenly with the need for small businesses to go online, um, that's a huge opportunity for, for younger people that they may know. You know, um, a lot of the, the small businesses in Mexico can be family run, so they might hire um just someone young for their family. So what, what I hope, and, and, and from there, you know, maybe it starts with creating a website and little by little talking about, okay, how can we um, use AI to, to improve certain aspects of our business? So I really think there's an opportunity for the future of your work to be um, an easier place for young people to get into. I also hope that with regards to AI, it's a more equal place with regards to gender. Uh, again, like I mentioned, um, if anyone here, you know, is listening and has a, an AI system, we really do encourage you to, to consider hiring a philosopher, a psychologist, someone that can, a sociologist, someone that will make sure that you're asking the right questions and producing a responsible um, service or product. And then what I really hope um, is that while we're seeing that maybe, you know, maybe in the US, we're not slowing down so much in terms of adoption of AI, but in Latin America, we are that either way, we can take this time where the pandemic has kind of changed everything and is making us rethink things to also rethink what responsible AI adoption looks like for the workforce and put in place strategies from the government, like, like Kevin mentioned, but also from the industry um, and possibly third, third parties who offer um, automation services. How, how we can all work together to make sure that um, no one's left behind and this is something that benefits everyone. Absolutely great sentiment. Paul, let's turn to you. Yeah, no, um, maybe three, three, three points. One is uh, I think trust is really the foundation that we need to, that we need to build. Reskilling, I think, is the engine of how we're going to get there. And then uh, innovation is how we're going to you know, reimagine the future and just to unpack that a little bit. We talked a lot about trust, so I won't go into that anymore, but that's essential to this. You know, we're going to have, a, you, know, we're, you know, one of my concerns why I wrote the first book is I was concerned if, if AI was driven the wrong direction, it could have a backlash. We, we might never realize a positive consequence, the positive outcome. So the trust is essential for us to get this right so we can achieve the positive potential of, of AI. Reskilling is, we talked about a lot, again, it's the engine of how we do it. We need to be creative in business and public and private cooperation, how we do it. One thing we're doing is uh, we just bought 60,000 of these uh, virtual reality headsets for our employees. So 60,000 of our employees, as we're onboarding them, are doing it in an immersive world. As we, this, the neuroscience and science shows that the learning will be much more effective in what they learn and how they learn. And by the way, a lot of that's powered 
by AI. So it, we need to be you know, creative in how we do the, the reskilling also. And then the innovation, it, we really, the, the possibilities are tremendous in terms of problems that we can solve. One of the reasons why we had a COVID, COVID vaccine as soon as we did, and I, I write about this actually in my new book, is, is Moderna and BioNTech actually both had, had an approach of using a cloud-enabled, big data-powered AI engine. In uh, Moderna's case, it was called their drug design studio that allowed them to rapidly use new AI techniques, convolutional neural networks and other things to rapidly innovate a new science of messenger RNA at unprecedented speed because of the way they use AI and technology. And that's, you know, that got a new drug to market faster and, you know, to profoundly offset and, you know, the, the impacts of the, of the, of the pandemic. And that's an example, you know, just one small example, a uh, big example, but, you know, small in terms of the big potential we have to use AI for, for tremendous positive impact as we reimagine the way we do things. Perfect, Paul. Thank you so much, Kevin. Well, I'll give you my Twitter response, which is the future of work is digital. Uh, and it is incumbent upon all of us to make sure that everyone, regardless of gender, income, geography, has the full opportunity to participate in it and make the most of it. Terrific, Paul. Terrific, Kevin. Thank you so much. Really tremendous sentiment. And I hope to have many more conversations with you all to come on these important issues. Um, so thank you so much to our panelists, to our audience today for joining us on this discussion about artificial intelligence and the need for a digital workforce. You can follow the Geotech Center at AC Geotech on Twitter. You can also find us on LinkedIn, um, as well as at our website, which will get put up in the chat. Thank you again for joining us today. Appreciate everyone's time. Take care.